Hey there, oh, Knicks wow. fans. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> Off to a rousing start. It's your boy, John of the Macri, with you for another episode of the Knicks Film School Podcast. Uh, I am joined today by a man who has apparently outlived uh, or outgrown his usefulness purely as a Knicks beat reporter and uh, the host of uh, America's favorite new uh, niche podcast sensation uh, on on Patreon, of course, because he's covering another basketball game played between two teams or not the Knicks in uh, three hours. What, what time? You, when do you have to leave to the arena? I mean, I'm going to miss the pregame pressers. I'm not. I, I'm oh, in shit. Oklahoma City. I'm in Oklahoma City. We're recording this. Tuesday. No, because I don't feel bad. I'm in Oklahoma City. We're recording this Tuesday afternoon. The Knicks play in Oklahoma City on Wednesday. Yep. And I just got in minutes ago. You did. And the Thunder, the Thunder play the Timberwolves tonight. And that's an awesome game. And yep. I was like, I should just go to the game. So I'm just, I'm, I have a credential, but I'm just like going to the game. I'm not, oh, so I'm not writing a story or anything. No. I, oh. I, I just I just want to see two awesome teams play some basketball. Might jump on a Thunder podcast after it's done. You I, know, leave it at that. I I think they call that a perk of the job, Mister Katz. Yes, <laughs> most definitely. Well, you know, if you're baseball writers, if you have like the B, the BBWAA card, you can walk into any arena or any stadium and watch any game whenever you want. No you don't notice? even need to get a credential. No notice. Just walk in. If you're a member of the Baseball Writers Association of America, you can just walk right in. That's really cool. Basketball, we don't have that. What Basketball, we don't have do that. However, when you get in the night early and there's an awesome game being played, go crazy. Also, I mean, you know, I used to cover the Thunder. Lots of friends in the OKC media who I'm still very close with. So I wanted to organize a dinner tonight. Then they were all like the Thunder are playing. So I was like, I'll just come to the game. Do they have good food at the, I don't even know what the arena is called. Paycom. It was Chesapeake Chesapeake Arena back in the day. Now it's Paycom. They're getting the new arena. Do they have good food? Not really. No, it's, I would say it's one of the lesser arenas, but they have a killer crowd. One of the best crowds in the league. When the Thunder are good. That is that's a top five crowd when the Thunder are good. And I am really excited to see what the crowd is going to be like now that they're actually good again and to be able to experience that in person. Because I experienced those crowds with the Russ and KD teams and the Russ, you know, MVP year and the Russ Paul George and all that. And those crowds were honestly, there wasn't a better crowd in the league. There were some others maybe as good. There wasn't a better crowd. Um, Andrew's not here to yell at us. So I'm going to have to be the adult and keep us from having like a 30 minute thunder discussion. Oh no. Um, but I'll just ask you briefly, like what this is, I, I can't, this okay. We really shouldn't go down this road. Okay. We'll try. We'll keep this to like a minute. When's the last time a team has been as well set up for the present and the future as this thunder organization is right now? I, I, I mean, well, when Steph exploded onto the scene, he was still young. Clay was still young. Draymond was still young. But they, I, they didn't have the assets that this franchise does. Maybe the maybe the present tense talent of Steph in like 2014 was higher than SGA right now. Although I, Jesus, I don't even know about that. Um, man, I don't know. I don't know. There's never. I don't think there's ever been a team with this many that's this good with this many draft picks. Whenever there's yeah, a team sure. yeah. that's 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 top three, top four in the conference, and they just have all of their own picks. We're like, oh, and they have all their own picks. They can go make a move, you know? Yeah. If there's yeah. a team that's really good and it has one extra pick, like, for example, in recent memory, Memphis was in a really good position, right? Sure. 50-some-odd wins a year. They had all their own picks. They had that Boston. Warriors pick. Boston had the Boston. Kings pick. Yeah. Boston, yeah, Boston had the Nets picks and the Kings pick, and they got – they got good and 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 they got into that position, but I mean the Thunder have a million picks. They have Clippers picks and they have Houston picks and they have Denver picks and they have Utah picks. And I mean that's really like like Utah and OKC own all of the picks, so it wow. only makes sense that you that OKC owns one of Utah's picks. It's just perfect. 
Yeah, we'll have a we'll have a Laurie Mark. Next time you have me on your your podcast, uh, Cats and Shoot on Patreon, by the way, for anybody who may who may Who said you're invited back, back John? You know, I, my mother always told me, don't assume because you make an ass out of you and me. Um, but if, if if you ever have me back, we could have the Lori Market and the OKC discussion because that's a that's a fascinating trade to me. Um, anyway, uh, let's uh, let's talk about that. Well, actually, before we talk about the next two brief things, one. Um, you and Benji had a, a funny joke about how, you know, a couple, couple of Jews podcasting on, on Christmas. All that's missing was the Chinese food. Guess what are Chinese food on Christmas, my guy? Because my wife was sick in bed with a stomach bug all day. So it was up to daddy to provide food for the young ones. And that was Chinese food all the way. So very couple, proud of you. Yes. A, a proud Italian man eating Chinese. I, I, I got soup dumplings. I was very, very happy. I was, I was. In, in very heaven. proud of you father father of the year it's christmas Thank and it's you. like you know what dinner's up to dad and you're like you know what we're just gonna order in when you know that if you were the one sick there'd be a beautiful meal on the table everyone well, would be happy but in fairness we were the reason we were home to begin with because i came down with covid so we were oh, like that's excised. true i forgot you had covid you've yeah been, it was you've been podcasting yeah. so much and you literally took a phone call from me for like 20 minutes when you had COVID, which, which yeah. Andrew, Andrew Claudio later told me knocked you out for the day. And I was like, John, why were you talking to me on the phone then? What's wrong with you? Cause you're more important than the podcast. No, that's so ridiculous. That's, that's insane. That's insane. All right. Uh, the second thing briefly, <laughs> go, give your dad a shout out for me. I love that he tried to vote for Dick Barnett for the All-Star game. Tell him to go back in onto the NBA's online portal and, and actually see if they could get, get the vote in. Um, that's an inside joke for subscribers of, of Cats and Shoot on Patreon. Yes. Check um, out the podcast, patreon.com slash cats and shoot. Speaking of which, you had a great discussion with Benji on your latest episode. So I and I'm gonna try to be cognizant of not going over um topics that you just went through um but i i'm gonna try to navigate those waters as we talk now um let's uh, let's go big picture for a sec because you guys dove deep into the milwaukee matchup and i could not agree more with everything you just said uh in that conversation they now what was it 10 days ago 11 days ago there was we were talking about how this team i know you were never worried about like how good they were, but the, there was definitely a sentiment out there of like, they have no quality wins and the last seven, 11 days. They beat Phoenix who I know Phoenix is now, I mean, talk about a team that's going through it. Would you agree that that was a quality win in the moment? I think it was a quality win. Definitely. Yeah. It, you know, Booker and KD had it going the whole thing. Uh, Lakers quality win. And now bucks quality win. I, for the first time all year, this is a, I probably shouldn't say this out loud because it's like, maybe I'm going to jinx it. That's how Knicks fans think. Um, I'm like very comfortable with where this team is at, even with the Mitchell Robinson injury, which is what I want to get into you into a little bit more with you in a moment. But I just want to start with like a 10,000 foot view. Like this is, is this just kind of what this team is going to be for the rest of the year? Could we just, it, I'm feeling pretty good. It, 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 is that okay? Yeah. Because they are pretty good, I, I, I think. I think they're holding down the fort without Mitchell Robinson pretty well. Uh, the The defense has not been great at all. No, but the offense has hit new levels. Uh, Brunson is scoring like crazy. Randall is scoring like crazy. Even with RJ Barrett struggling, their shot selection is is really good. They're getting to the rim a lot. Divincenzo's hitting threes. You know. You know what's shocking. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, like really, truly shocking to me. I mean, they, they've, they've been top 10 in percentage, in three-point percentage all yep. season. Yep. And they've hovered between like five and 10 all season in three-point percentage. And I just never saw that coming. I never saw, I never saw that being something that held up the offense. You know what I mean? I thought they'd be a good offense again. I never saw that coming. But Brunson's hitting threes. DiVincenzo's hitting threes. I mean, Wait, the offense is, is really good. Hold on. Top 10 with Julius Randle. Did yesterday put him above 30%? Because he was under before yesterday. He's at he's at 29.3%. Okay. 
So with the guy that was forget their leading three point shooter last year in terms of volume, a guy was invited to the fucking three point contest last year shooting under 30 percent from three. That's number one. And number two, R.J. Barrett, after uh, not I don't think he missed the three for the first two weeks of the season. He's another guy that's been under 30 percent since he has come back, which is now a span of 16 games so not insignificant sample size. So, like, when you throw those two things in, it's really freaking impressive that they are where they are. Helps when Jalen Brunson makes like half his threes. Yes. Helps when DiVincenzo, by the way. I mean, DiVincenzo has been insane from three. Yep. He's just hitting everything lately. Uh, I, I, offensively, they look really good. The bench lineup is playing crazy fast. When Hartenstein is out there, they move the ball well. They screen better. They move better. They cut better when Hartenstein is there. I mean, the offense is really good when Hartenstein's at the five, I think, whether it's the starters, whether you're talking about those bench lineups. Offensively, they're in a good spot, and and they're scrappy enough that defensively they can pull some stuff out. I worry about them in a playoff series without Mitchell Robinson, if that's what it comes down to. I worry about that because I worry about how the defense will hold up. He's such a massive part of their defensive identity, but they're in a good spot. They're still a good team. I mean, you know, we talk about them having quality wins, not having quality wins, whatever. They, they've played 29 games this year. They're 17 and 12. They've played Boston and Milwaukee a combined seven times. Yep. They're one and six in those games. Okay. They're not beating Boston and Milwaukee. That's fine. New, nobody news, thought, everybody else. <laughs> no, well, nobody picked them to beat Boston or Milwaukee. Nobody thinks they should be beating Boston and Milwaukee. Nobody's like, well, this team should be first or second in the in the East, and they're squandering it. They're 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 playing to where they should be against the rest of the league. That makes them what sixteen and six. They're playing they're yeah. playing good basketball right now. It, I want to get to the because you just touched on a lot of stuff that is relevant to the Mitch conversation that I want to have with you. But before I get there, am I imagining it, or did you not tuck a line in your? Mitch injury uh, the news as first reported by your colleague Shams Sharanya that uh, uh, the Knicks had applied for a disabled player exception which means Mitchell Robinson at least the team doctors think it's more likely than not he's going to be out for the year Um, did you not tuck a line in your story in response to that that like I forget what your word I may be imagining this or conflating you with Begley which happens more than I'd like to admit, but like something along the lines of like the Knicks internally would perhaps like to do better this year than they did last year. Did you write something to that effect? I don't remember. You might be <laughs> conflating me with Begley. I mean, I, I, that's, it, that's true. That is true. Like, so it's true. I didn't, was- whatever, whether I'm getting it for you, or I'm getting it for me. And it's it, that like, there are people within the Knicks who even now in light of the Mitch injury, like they still view this as a year. Like we would like to go further than last year. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if they're going to do that. I think there's a world where they go as far as they went last year. Am I, am I crazy for thinking that that's an unreasonable expectation? It's unreasonable to think that they're going farther than they did last year. Well, Am I missing something in that you just talked about two teams that are two of the top three, maybe four teams in the league. And you could argue that they're there. There's like a gap between the certainly Boston, Milwaukee. Maybe we could have a long conversation about, but like mm-hmm. that's two teams. So that means if you're going further than last year, ostensibly you are going further than one of those two teams or, or yep. and all likely they're trying to be one of those. Like, I think it, the notion that like, Oh, we internally think that we should, we have a good chance or like a chance at like a real chance at a conference finals. I think that that's, I know I shouldn't be saying this as a Knicks podcast host, but like, that's pretty far fetched. Is it not? I mean, I think what you're doing right now is you're trying to analyze extremely competitive people's, objectives that's and goals with a non-bias fine. eye. Fine. Okay. The no, people that's, that's who very, want them to good. go farther are maniacally competitive people. Which is good. Who have gotten to their position of success because they are maniacally competitive. So, that's just how people think. You made the second round last year. You lost. You brought back basically the same roster plus Steven Genzo. The expectation is build on that. Young team, build on that. Now. 
I don't think it's realistic. I also think that if you walk up to the average person in the next building and you say, what do you think this team does? I think their answer is probably chance to win a playoff series. I think that's, Great. that's probably the honest answer. I don't think there's anybody who's anybody of import who's, who's, who's looking at the team with rose colored rose colored glasses of being like, this team needs nothing else and just top two in the conference. But I, I do also think there's a world where if the matchups fall their way. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. There is something could happen. Mitchell Robinson comes back earlier than expected and is in good shape and looks good. Looks like himself. Like if Mitchell Robinson's there, they actually match up pretty well against Milwaukee. I know they have lost three out of four to Milwaukee. I know things look really difficult when a team is hitting 55% of its threes against you. Is that not normal? When it, when a team stops hitting 55% of its threes against you, things are a little different. Milwaukee is not good on the defensive boards. They're not good defending in transition. The Knicks can take advantage of both those things massively, and they don't have anybody to guard Jalen Brunson. And if they want to use Giannis, they don't like using Giannis as an on-ball defender. And Giannis guards Julius Randle. They like using Giannis as a helper. They don't like him putting on putting him on the other team's best best player and all of that. Remember the whole controversy of him not guarding Jimmy Butler and him being in the weak side corner for a lot of that series when they lost. They just they 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 have the ability at full strength to make Milwaukee uncomfortable. But we're far away from that. And Mitchell Robinson's not healthy. So we'll see. I think but I think they could win a playoff series again, depending on the matchup. Me too. And to be very clear, and I should have made this clear earlier when I posed this thing to you, like it was specifically post Mitch injury that I was perhaps like I could see a world where once that happens, like there is an internal not like we're giving up. the. Se- Obviously, they're not giving up a season, I, which is we're going to get to a conversation that I want to have about Mitch and Hardenstein and the ceiling of this team. And we'll get to it literally in a moment. But. I guess I I would have maybe thought it's not like a get out of jail free card, but like, okay, he's literally the foundation of what we do at both ends of the floor. He is. We are now saying to the league, we do not think he's going to be back this year. Like you you get what I'm angling at here. That's all. I, yes. Yeah. Yes, I do. I do. I think the whole way that they've handled the Mitchell Robinson situation is so weird, by the way. Well, do we have an official do we have anything? No. And I, I don't think we're going to. The whole thing is so weird, though, because so they apply for the t- disabled player exception, right? Yeah. And that is, for those who don't know, that's a little CBA eccentricity that says if a player is more likely than not out through June 15th, and that's according to the NBA's independent doctors, uh, if he is more likely than not out through that date, then the team can get a exception that can use as a trade exception or free agency exception for half that player's salary. In order for the Knicks to get that, that means independent doctors, the NBA's doctors have to look at Mitchell Robinson and decide, okay, he is substantially more likely than not out through June 15th. And yet the day after the Knicks apply for that thing, we go in there to a press conference and we ask Tibbs, what's the deal with Mitchell Robinson's timeline? He's like, it's still the same thing. Reevaluated eight to 10 weeks. And he says, well, it's just reevaluated. It's going to be reevaluated to 10 weeks. There are a number of follow-up questions asked. I even asked like one of my questions, the, the first two words of one of my questions was, which was the fourth question in the sequence was I'm confused. <laughs> That's really how I started it. I was like, I'm confused. If it just seems face. like all, this all seems like a waste of time if he could be back in eight to 10 weeks. And here's why it's so weird strategically, why it is so weird the way the Knicks are handling all of this, because in order for them to get the DPE, the league has to believe that Mitchell Robinson is more substantially more likely than not. That's not my wording. That is the CBA's word. Substantially more likely than not. Do you know what it takes for a doctor to be like substantially more likely than not? You cannot play basketball through this date that's six months out. Like doctors are really conservative in every direction, right? They're like, yeah, you know, you could be back at some point. You could be back in a long way. And, you know, just rehab and keep going on. Like for a doctor to say you are substantially more likely than not out there June 15th, 
you got to be real injured, right? So the Knicks have to, the league has to believe that he is substantially more likely than not out through June 15th. This is and correct. yet the Knicks are standing up there publicly after they are trying to get this extra asset, this DPE, in which again, they have to convince the league and the league's doctors have to be convinced that Mitchell Robinson is substantially more likely than not out through June 15th. And the Knicks are like, yeah, reevaluated sometime between February 5th and 19th. Why will the league grant them the DPE if they're just publicly putting out statements being like, yeah, reevaluated February, February, and, and well, we'll see what his timetable is then? Well, one of two things is true. They're either bullshitting you, the press, which is, would not be uncommon uh, given how they generally do business, or they're just throwing shit against the wall and they're seeing what sticks, which like, I, we don't need to get into the whole discussion of like, what if the league suspects the Knicks of applying for something that they themselves believe they've, they, they shouldn't get? Like, I, whatever. I, to- totally, John, you, you're totally right. My point is, I don't understand the strategy. If you're going to apply for the DPE, then you shouldn't be going out there the next day being like, well, he, we don't know. Maybe it's. Yeah, but see, but that doesn't. Does that. Th- hold on. You're saying that you were surprised that, that that's the answers that Tibbs gave you? I, no, not no. No, of course you're not. <laughs> you fucking work not in the place every day. Of course you're not surprised. It just strategically doesn't make sense if you're trying to get a disabled player exception. It I, just. Look, it's a Knicks. That's that's the answer. Can we talk? The answer. It's can we Knicks. talk? Can we talk about how how baseball is more woke than than no. basketball right now, and how basketball should change the name of the exception to the injured player exception because that would be more acceptable in twenty twenty three. Listen, man, you t- talking to a special education teacher here. I took many a class in terms of the power of language when it comes to disabilities and, and whatnot and what have you. Um, Baseball's got the injured list now. It's time for basketball to follow. We the Injured we'll, player exception. Next podcast, we'll, we'll, we'll take down that charge. Um, let's go. go. Before Andrew strangles me when he, when he hears the spot. This is Nick's adjacent. <laughs> This is no, it is, no, it is. It is. Andrew it's, 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 it's Jason. The point this is, I, this okay. is in the weeds, but it's 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 Knicks related. We're getting back to Mitch a second. My only point that I wanted to make about the Milwaukee matchup, and then we'll move on from it. And I don't know that it's a point that I need to make because you could probably say this is true of any matchup the Knicks have in any series against any good opponent. Um, my my not fear, but like. I think the series comes down to Julius. I think Milwaukee will be like, for all the reasons you talked about with Benji, Jalen, you want to go get 40? Here's here. Here's 40. That's not what generates, not that Jalen's not a good passer. I'm not trying to say he's not, he's a, I think he's a phenomenal passer for, for his spot, like, or whatever. That's not how, that's not how the offense gets worrying. That's not how Jalen Brunson gets worrying. That's not how the offense gets worrying. The offense gets whirling when Julius Randle starts you know, breaking guys down and wrecking havoc. And my fear is that with Giannis as that one-on-one defender, he can't, it's harder for him to do that. Now, Benji highlighted some stuff uh, and some clips on Twitter about how the Knicks got him going downhill and this and that. I'm just saying it's a tough, that's a tough ask of Julius for a seven game series, but that's the only point I wanted to make there. Super tough ask. Uh, He did have 41 in that unbelievable in season tournament game against them. I thought he played I thought he played really well on Monday. I thought he had a really good game. I thought he had a good game. He's yeah, constantly absolutely. attacking. One thing that he'll do, I think, more against a team like Milwaukee if they play them in a playoff series, I bet we see him run more pick and rolls. I had a really good conversation with him. Yeah, like ball handler. Okay. Uh, take, 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 take a big man out of the paint and try to attack that way. I had a really good conversation with him about that last week for a story that's going to run later this week about – kind of his mentality in, in running more pick and rolls right now. He's running more pick and rolls than he really ever has. And 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 I, I think that's something that that we'll see him do, something that he did against Milwaukee a, a decent amount. And and the other thing where he really does it is once he gets downhill, he has been so good at creating threes this year. Yes. And Milwaukee <laughs> tends to overhelp, tends to scramble. If you put that perimeter defenders in rotation, they often don't recover nope. and you can go swing, swing and you can get a corner three. And I, I think that could be a good method of offense for them. But we are so far ahead of ourselves. No, it's next to Milwaukee. But I, 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 I wanted to hit on that. He had a pet. I know it wasn't on a pick and roll because uh, I don't even think he 
he, I don't even think he started a drive, but he had a pass to quickly in so the fourth quarter it had to be the fourth quarter because quickly scoring barrage in the fourth where he rifled the pass over to quickly in the corner and quickly sank a three. I just like the speed and like the precision of that. Pass. Like he's, he's never passed this good in his career. Um, I think that's, that's safe to say. And yeah, I mean, I love, I love what we're seeing from Julius and like you nailed it on the pod you did with Benji on cats and shoot. He put up a whole hum, whatever he put up yesterday, 26 and nine or something. And it's like, Oh, okay. It's, normal course of business right yeah he played a good game and it wasn't just like stat padding you know no. like from a couple years ago where it's like oh julius put up 20 and 10 no i mean he had a he had a really good game against a good team that that helped him win he's he's playing great basketball really for like a month and a half now he's been so aggressive yeah um and they and they're gonna need him because like whatever series we're talking about it's it's ultimately going to come down to um, I think I, I think it, it will wind up coming down to him, but we'll we'll talk about that when the time comes. Uh, Mitchell Robinson. Okay, we just had the whole conversation about the disabled player exception, uh, dancing around the notion that there is a in some world there is a possibility that Mitchell Robinson does not play basketball again this year, and that is because he um, had screws inserted in his ankle. Is that right? Isn't that the report? That's the report from Stephen Bondi. I personally okay. have. Not oh, that's right. I apologize. That, I forgot that was. Bondi. But that's okay. but that's the report from from. Bondi. I didn't mean to put you on the spot with that. Um, no, you're not putting me on the spot. I haven't heard that that's wrong or anything. I okay. just I haven't been able to confirm that. Okay, I'm going to try to ask a question, and it's going to be a meandering uh, word vomit, and you're going to be left to do something with it. But I'm going to try my best. This is. Would you say before I ask it? Would you would you say that this is a serious injury? course okay for a big man who like relies on his athleticism and the whole thing uh I don't anytime even a big it, man has surgery anywhere near his foot or his ankle or his knee or anything like that that's serious okay i'm not gonna i don't want to have a whole conversation about is mitch injury prone or not it's not interesting i want to focus on this right now which is that this is a serious thing it's a serious procedure and there is at least some like you have to kind of do a little bit of hoping that even with all the proper rehab and everything, he's going to make it back to peak form and the whole thing. The night that we found out he was probably going to be out for the year. I came on here. It was during the Nets post game. And I think you, yeah, you, you, you were listening to at least part of it. Cause you had some super chats. Must um, and I said, I think their ceiling goes down. And what I want to ask you is whether, I was maybe too quick to say that. And here's here's why. Uh, I looked it up a little, bit, a little while ago after uh, Benji put out a clip on Twitter showing something very good that uh, Isaiah Hardenstein was doing to facilitate offense, which he's been doing a lot of. Uh, I know there's been a lot of numbers tossed around with a lot of different combinations. Him, Brunson, Randall, those three, almost 600 possessions on cleaning the glass. 130 offensive rating. That's insane um <clears throat> just those, those three guys harnstein best two knicks uh or offensive you know engine knicks and the eye test seems to pass the eye test because he allows them to do so many different sorts of things that's why my eyebrows raised when you brought up a minute ago randall pick and roll ball handler because I hadn't even thought it because we've been spending so much time talking about, well, Brunson using Hardenstein as the outlet when they trap him above the arc. Well, I hadn't even really spent any time thinking about Randall, like pick and roll with Hardenstein, the things that that allows him to do in the hole. So 130 offensive rating. And like, look, he's not Mitch on defense. I don't, I don't we don't need to have a conversation about that, that he's not Mitch on defense. We know that Mitch covers up so many ills. And with the Knicks perimeter defenders being what they are occasionally, that is so valuable. What I am wondering is with this uncertainty out there about the long-term whatever of Mitch, I, I, I wonder if the rest of this year might not be like a test run for like, hey, not like we're going to see if we could do it differently because Hardenstein does so many of the similar things that Mitch does, but if we do get into a playoff series, and this is what you said this before, like it, it will matter in the playoffs, you know, 
But like the playoffs are when everybody ratchets it up the intensity. So I'm almost wondering, like, if the Knicks perimeter defenders get into a playoff series and they know they they obviously they know they don't have Mitch there to cover their ass, and they are really on their P's and Q's, crossing their T's, dotting their eyes, the whole thing, and are giving it 10 out of 10, every possession, every game. Do you does the need for Mitch on defense? lesson to the point where the benefits that you're getting from Hardenstein, I'm getting there, I'm getting to the finish line, where the where the benefits of what Hardenstein's given you on the offensive end actually raise the ceiling of this team in a high-level playoff series. I, I think I got it all out. I, I, did, do you understand what I'm trying to get at here? I think what you're trying to ask me is if, in the long run, Isaiah Hardenstein is a better fit for this team in the playoffs than Mitchell Robinson is. So this is why you're the writer and I'm the guy who bullshits in front of a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> and you just didn't want to say it like that. Didn't want to say it. And so you talked around it. Talked you did a little dance. Tap dance. The, yeah. You did a little tap dance. You did a Sinatra. I'm, good at I'm a good dancer, yeah. man. You've never yeah. seen me, bro. You know, or Sinatra. You went, you went a full Fred Astaire and just, just tapped right around it. You did a good job. Talented. You did dude. a good job. Uh, Thank you. So. a really complicated question okay at least makes me think it's a decent question i will say one thing that it makes me think of okay so two years ago when randall had that really downtrodden season yes i wrote a story a decent chunk of the way into the year about how randall you know people were criticizing him for not getting to the rim enough and i wrote a story about how randall was actually getting to the rim for a really high number of his shot attempts when he didn't play next to, I guess it was at the time, New Orleans Noel or Mitchell Robinson. And when he wasn't next to one of those guys, it was something like 40% of his shots were at the rim, which is a really high number. And it doesn't include all the times he gets there and gets fouled. Really high number. And when they, they weren't next to him, that number was like cut in half or even less than that. And when, when he was next to Robinson or when he was next to, to, to Nolan Snow well, and it's because the floor scrunches. Now, Randall has made a very concerted effort this year to really, truly understand, as Tibbs always puts it, the value of shots. That taking a shot right next to the rim is a lot easier than taking it farther away from the rim. You're going to have a better percentage. And I don't say that and like I feel like that came off condescending. And I I, I didn't it, I didn't mean it to be. He he really absorbed that over this summer and wanted to make a conscious change. He's catching the ball on the move more. He's getting downhill more. He is running more pick and rolls. He is prioritizing, you know, positioning on his post ups a lot more than he used to. It's why he's been so good for the last month and a half. So it makes me think of that dynamic that he had a couple of years ago when he really wasn't going well, when you mentioned that kind of stuff. And I think the play that you're referencing that Benji pointed out on Twitter is the one where Jalen Brunson is kind of down low in the in, near, near the basket, but not at the basket. And he's, he's kind of trying a little crafty post move and Brooke Lopez isn't able to come over and help all the way because Isaiah Hartenstein is on the baseline, maybe five feet out of the paint and Lopez knows that if he steps up onto Brunson, Hardenstein is going to slip right under the basket. Brunson's going to dump it to him. Hardenstein's going to get a layup or dump. No problem. Knicks are going to get two points, so he's got to stay off of him. That's not spacing in the conventional sense of, of people here spacing, and they're like spacing to the three-point line. But spacing is something that happens all over the court. That's spacing. Mitchell Robinson doesn't necessarily have that spacing. Because even if Mitch were to slide over into that dunker spot, the other team probably doesn't trust him to catch the pass. And or if at he least does, catch it cleanly. He'll bring the ball down too. And it'll get swiped away. And so you can defend that differently. Yeah. Do I think the offense can be better? Sure. I mean, part of the reason they play the style they play is because they have Mitch. You know, 
they they recognize his offensive limitations, but they also recognize all of the great things he brings, like the offensive rebounding and the defensive rebounding now and all the great defensive traits. So yeah. they've they've constructed a roster around him. I don't think they need to play that style offensively. I think they are willing to play another way if they have different personnel. Defensively is where I'm a little more skeptical. Where <laughs> with this coach, Tibbs is Tibbs' whole life is built around rim protection. Like, I just imagine, like, if Tibbs is just, like, out to dinner with a friend, his friend is, like, it's, like, August. He hasn't watched. There hasn't been an NBA game in months. Like, his friend is, like, how is, yeah, how is, how's, how's everything going? How's your offseason going? And Tibbs is just muttering something about rim protection. Like, he's just, he builds his defenses from the paint out. He wants to take the paint away and that requires a really strong presence inside. Usually a singular person because that is somebody who's going to be really good. And Mitch has become that. He's become an excellent paint protector, an excellent all-around defender, a great pick and roll defender, a great turnover guy, a really smart shot blocker. He's not going after and chasing shots and all that stuff anymore. He had just become this this newly evolved sort of Mitchell Robinson. And I thought he was playing it at really an all defense level at the time he got hurt. I agree. I think defensively they need somebody like that or else they're going to be vulnerable because they don't have a big wing. They don't have like a big time stopper. I, I think they're going to be really defensively vulnerable with the way that they defend with the way the tips wants to defend and with the roster they currently have. You can have a good defense without an elite rim protector in the middle. I just wonder if this coach is going to want that. I think he is going to want the elite rim protector in the middle. And by the way, most coaches do. It doesn't have to be Mitchell Robinson, though. And I think that's where we get to it, where it's like, okay, is there somebody who is a really good paint protector, (laughs) but who isn't going to have the offensive limitations of Mitchell Robinson, who is going to be able to do maybe what Hartenstein does? on the offensive end. Is there somebody who fills that role in that way? And then you start to have the conversation of like, okay, moving forward, does this roster need another center? But so far, like when Mitch plays, they're really damn good. So you stole my thunder because the point, the way, the, where I wanted to get to was, Mitch's importance on this roster that, again, I'm going to keep referencing this because it was a fantastic conversation that you guys had, and it really veered into why is Emmanuel quickly averaging 24 minutes? This is a roster built around small guards. If two wing, quote unquote, wing size players, and one of those is six four, because Josh Hart's not a big, I mean, he's, he's big, but he's not, he's not a tall man. And then there's Brunson quickly, uh, DiVincenzo, and Grimes. That is the roster where you need Mitchell Robinson to cover up for all of the things that he is able to cover up for. If all of a sudden you swapped out one of those, I mean, it actually wouldn't necessarily mean to be one of the small guards, but if you put, if you injected the prototypical, we all know who it is, the big wing defender, right? Then all of a sudden, I wonder if it becomes as necessary. You took it in a different direction. You're like, well, can we get our cake and eat it too and find someone who does what Mitch does and also some of the offensive stuff that Hardenstein does. I don't know, man. I, what Hartstein is 26 years old? 25. He's 25. Man, I'm not trying to, you know, make this about like, oh, maybe, you know, maybe all maybe that Reddit thread that you know said he's like Nikola Jokic in, in waiting. Uh maybe it was actually onto something. But like he just does a lot of shit really good. And I I we're not at the point yet where we have to worry about his next contract. But man, talk about a guy who's gonna make himself some money if he really goes out there and plays good ball over the next however many months it is. Um, it's just, a, it's a, it's a fascinating situation to me that I think the, when the, the, the news was reported, I was like, it's okay. They'll deal with it. And they'll move on. And now the more I've been thinking about it, the more I'm watching them, I'm like, man, this maybe opens up a bigger can of worms than I ever fully anticipated. That's kind of all I wanted to say about it. Here's, here's what I'll add. And this, I believed was true at the time of the injury. And I certainly believe it's true now. The fall off from Mitch to Hartenstein is not the thing that hurts the Knicks the most with the Mitch injury. It's the fall off from Hartenstein 
to whomever is going to be that backup center now, whether it's Sims, whether it's Taj, who actually played pretty well in the Milwaukee game and is getting his footing. And I am wondering when Jericho Sims comes back, I am wondering who gets the minutes back up five. I know who I want to get the minutes. It is ripe for comedy, Jonathan. Dude. (laughs) It is again. I'm not going to have I'm not going to have the discussion you just had with Benji because you guys nailed it. Like, yeah, Taj can't jump over a phone book, but as Benji said, he hasn't been able to jump over a phone book in five years. He's the smartest player on the court. And that goes a long fucking way. It really does. And you saw it against the box. And as you articulated, um, you bring the ball down below your shoulders and you're a big man. That's death. If Taj is anywhere nearby, it's also something that he never does. So I don't know. I'm the biggest Taj fan in the world. So for me, you're like, are the Knicks going to get hurt by playing Taj Gibson 12 minutes a night? No, but that's, I don't think that's the concern. I think the concern is what you guys alluded to, which is God forbid, if there's a game where Hardenstein gets in serious foul trouble or really God forbid, he gets hurt. Then it's that obviously bigger issue. Then you're really in trouble. Yeah. I mean, look, we're probably not going to see it, but I would really, with this evolved version of Julius Randall, with him wanting to run pick and rolls and wanting to get downhill and all this stuff, Man, we saw it for like four possessions in the Brooklyn game. <laughs> yes, I, I don't, I don't even. I, this is not even like some sort of like me being like, why won't Tibbs do this? This would help the team so much. That's not. That's not what I'm doing here. I just want to see it. I yeah. just want to see Randall with who the five. What, what's what's your lineup? I want to see Randall at the five. You know what? I want to see that 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 four man lineup that that so annihilates Brun- so quickly, much. Hart. That we've been talking about Brunson quickly, Hart, Randall, and I want to see it with RJ. You do okay, interesting. Yeah, it gives it gives you a little more size defensively on the wing. I think I think it depends on who you're going against. It could work with Grimes too. Gets you a little more spacing and some more on ball defense. But I was thinking Di Vincenzo. For the shooting piece, because you, I mean, you, you alluded to at the top of the show, he's hitting, he is literally hitting half of his threes since the second week of the that, season. That helps too. And DiVincenzo's feisty. He's been good defensively, feisty defender. He's he's good off the ball. He's good in passing lanes. He's he's been good. I mean, I I think you can pick your spots with that. I'm not saying sure. you just run that against anybody. You no. do it against in a lineup in a situation where it makes sense in a in a game context that makes sense against a team that makes sense. But like, man. I'd love to see that. Sure. Yeah, sure. Just like get the shooting out there. Put DiVincenzo out there, right? And 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 you just switch everything on defense, except for with Brunson. And and you just you just figure the rest out. You play high turnover basketball. DiVincenzo would make sense from a high turnover basketball standpoint. So would Hart. Quickly can run. You're loaded with ball handlers. You got five guys who can handle. Like that's. I would just love to see it. I would love to see how effective Julius Randle is at getting to the rim. If he can run a pick and roll with Josh Hart as the screener and he's got Brunson quickly and DiVincenzo on the outside where it's like, oh yeah, you're going to help off a Jalen Brunson. Enjoy these three points that he's going to hand you. Or you're going to help off of DiVincenzo who I don't think has missed an open three in a month. Enjoy this. Like he's, he's, it, it, it's, it, I would just love to see it. I'm That's, not even saying they have to do it. That would be bad defensively. It would be really bad defensively. Yeah, but that's, that's why I said DiVincenzo, because the thing I love about DiVincenzo, I don't even care what his actual steel numbers are. Like, it just seems like when, when he's in there, he, there is a tenacity to him. I, some of those possessions against Dame yesterday, like, he knows his limitations. He's going to make up for it. Like, when have we watched DiVincenzo this year? We're like, man, DiVincenzo really doesn't, he's not bringing it tonight defensively. Like, he gives it his all pretty much whenever he's out there. And that, and his timing getting, as you said, in the passing lanes. So, yeah, you're going to get some possessions where you're, you're, you're just going to get beat. Okay, it happens. He'll make up for it with some of those steals and, and, and the rotations and whatnot. And then you throw it quickly. And 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 Bronson and you you nailed it with Hart as the screener. That's the lineup, man. That's the one I would want to see. Yeah. So like, 
It's not even again. It's not even that I want to see it. I just like as a you want to see it. It's okay. No, I'm like I'm like as a basketball theorist. I just want to see what it looks like. You know, I want to see how it goes. I want to see is it horrendous defensively or is it bad defensively? But do they run guys out of the gym offensively, and so it makes up for it? Like I also think like if I were going to do that, if I were Tibbs, the spots that I would pick would be so specific to Randall too. Like I would do it when oh. they were playing. I would do it when they were playing a team that had a really good player who Randall considered like his competitive <laughs> equal. Because those are times when he goes the hardest. Yeah. And those are the times when he goes the hardest on switches. And you're probably going to switch with him defensively in those situations. And the times when Randall's at his best defensively is when he's going up against someone who who could conceivably be like, I'm better than you. And Julius could conceivably respond. No, you're not, you know? And, and those are the times where Randall is at his best defensively. And he's also at his best sometimes switching because he just doesn't want to get squared up, blown by smaller guy, all that kind of stuff. And he can look pretty solid. That's when he uses his tools. And there, there've been times where they switch and it looks okay. I'm just like, I would massage the situation to where from a basketball standpoint, from a personality standpoint, everything kind of worked. And I would see if, if Randall and Brunson could just feast and quickly too. Uh, it, that could work. They're also quick decision makers in that lineup. You know, yeah. Hart's just going to get rebounds. He's just going to go quickly. He's just going to go. Brunson's obviously really smart like that. I, could work. I don't know if it's the best idea in the world or the worst idea in the world. It might be the worst. It might no, be the worst, it, which, is, which is why but I you don't. To see what it looks like. But it because is, I would love to see the worst idea in the world. Are you kidding me? Of course you would. If you said to me, I came up with the worst idea in the world, I don't want to see what that looks like. Come on. What I was going to say is against the Pacers specifically. Yes. You know why that would be the best? Well, I got a, one guess can, for you. I can only imagine the OB fans freaking out about watching Julius Randle play the five against Obi right. when he could never do it with Obi. <laughs> yeah. And you think he would, I mean, he, but he liked Obi. He genuinely liked Obi, right? Yes, totally. Yeah. They get along. Yeah. 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 So it's not, no, I'm I, not I, talking I mean, about the two of them. I'm talking yeah, about the, the reaction amongst the Obi fans. I, it would work against, that's a team where it's like, that makes sense. That's not a defensive minded team. No, they've got miles Turner in the middle. Yep. You're going to have to draw him. You're going to have to draw him out to the perimeter like that. That is a team where it's like, okay, they'll make sense. They're not a great rebounding team. They're probably not going to kill you there. Like those are the teams where it's like, Hey, maybe experiment. But I, to be clear, like this is, this is all fiction. Why you come on my podcast and fucking just take the big spoon. You don't even go with the little spoon. You take the big spoon and you just step, Stir the shit. That's all you think. You're sh- shit, shit stir, Fred Katz. Um, there's like five different things I wanted to get to that we, of course, didn't get to because we'd never get to anything. Um, none of which are Pistons related, actually. Have the Pistons won since the last? No, they have not won since the last time you. I really enjoyed, by the way, when I was listening to uh, the post game show the night that Mitch got. It was the night that they applied for the DPE. The Chums reported it, and you unironically mentioned Isaiah Stewart. On I the did. Podcast. Yeah. It was. I think it was, it was the first everyone. time. It was the first time I think Isaiah Stewart's ever been <clears throat> mentioned on this podcast. Unironically. Um. Okay. Two more things, and then I I have to go. Uh. One. I just I, I, look. People listening to this, I'm like, Macri, are you gonna? What? Well, I don't need to listen to Fred Katz on this podcast, and all you do is shamelessly plug his podcast. You guys had so, the 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 Emmanuel quickly minutes discussion. Not a Emmanuel Cookie or an Emmanuel Cookie Minutes discussion. You had the Emmanuel Cookie Minutes discussion on your pod, which is why specifically I didn't want to have it on here. And I just want to say, like, I know it's easy for engagement. It's super easy for engagement to go on Twitter and be like, Emmanuel Cookie is fucking awesome. He should be playing this many minutes. Why is he only playing this many minutes? There is so much nuance that goes into it. And you spent, what, 20 minutes talking about it with Benji? Who's as we spent a little while. Yeah. Um, I just want to just like say, regardless of what your opinion is on it, at least appreciate the fact that there's a lot more going on. Um, and also, 
subscribe to Fred's Patreon um, because you nailed it. It's a tough, it's a tough call, and um, there's a lot of factors at play. I did want to ask you one question off of that, which is one thing you guys did not talk about. F- from one to ten, how much do you think RJ's? What's the word? Placement in the organizational hierarchy factors into like if RJ was just a guy, same stats, same everything, same size, same everything. He was just a guy. Do you think Emmanuel quickly would be? I, I think it, I think we'd be at the closing lineup because then you'd have Hart in the RJ place. So it would actually be two spots changing, it'd be quickly and hard. And then it would uh, RJ on the bench with like a Steven Chenzo now. How much do you think that plays into it? It definitely plays into it some. There's always politics inside a locker room, inside an organization. It unquestionably plays into it some. I understand that in a perfect world, it shouldn't. But it does. Okay. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's the only thing, though. You know, Benji mentioned on the podcast that part of the reason why, why quickly doesn't get as many minutes as he was getting last year or as many as a lot of people, myself included, you know, I, I, you look at that number and you're like, he's too good of a player to get 24 minutes. Which is true. This, by the way, is why he and the Knicks could not come to an extension. Because the Knicks are saying, yeah, you're really good. You're a really good player. We agree with everything you're saying about how good you are. But your role is capped here. And we can't pay that amount of money for the role that you're going to be in. Now we can have the discussion about the role. Tibbs has clearly, and Benji made this point on my podcast, Tibbs has clearly kind of divided the smalls into RJ and Hart, who are the two bigger of them. Big smalls. And yeah. can, guard, can guard bigger, really can guard the bigger guys. And then the rest of them, Brunson, quickly, DiVincenzo, Grimes. And with RJ, he just feels that need to get the length. Like, for example, end of the Milwaukee game. I yep. That that lineup is running. That lineup is yep. revving. And with about two and a half minutes left. It was three and a half. Quickly. I looked it up. Three and a half. I and I didn't agree with it. And you know me, I don't I don't disagree with anything, Tibbs Ups. I didn't agree with it at the time, but you're gonna make the point that you're you made. Okay. Yeah, three and a half. He pulls he pulls quickly and puts in RJ. Yep. I didn't totally agree with it either, but RJ played a really good game against Milwaukee. And I asked Tibbs after the game why he made that sub. He said he wanted to get more length on the floor. Justifiable. They, it turned out, actually, I thought RJ, the last three minutes, played like had some phenomenal defensive possessions. He had one incredible defensive possession where he had a phenomenal closeout on, on Damian Lillard. Uh, he, he, he had some really good defensive possessions. and. It was because of his length. So what Tibbs wanted was what actually happened. So who am I to say, "Eh, this should have happened, this shouldn't have happened. What what Tibbs was prioritizing actually worked. It worked out. The process made perfect sense. But you end up with quickly playing 22 minutes. And it goes back to this thing of Tibbs wanting more size, Tibbs wanting more length. And and I don't know if Tibbs has looked at these numbers yet that I'm about oh, you to know say. he has. I'm sure I, I'm going to guess he has. I just don't, I don't know. You don't know for a fact. So, but. so Tibbs, according to cleaning the glass, Tibbs has played 207 consequential possessions, non-garbage time possessions this year where he hasn't had only 207 possessions all year where he hasn't had either Hart or Barrett on the floor. You know what the Knicks net rating is oh. in those 207 possessions? I, I, I could wager a guess. What do you think? I, what do we think? Plus, pl- I would plus 20 something. They're minus 19.6. Okay. Well, there when, you go. When neither Hart nor RJ is out there, they're minus 19.6 per 100. So they're probably like, my, they're like minus 40 in 207 possessions without those and, two guys. Now that's, it's a small amount of possessions, but my, my, my point is that that's, that's the, the first percentile. It is the yeah. one percentile. That's where and, we're at with that. And to be clear, Randall, Randall Shirley is on the floor for all of those. For not all of them, but for a, for a lot of them. 
I mean, he's on the floor for a whole bunch of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, he's on the floor for the vast majority of them. Okay. Uh, and Brunson is on the floor for the vast majority of them. I mean, the most commonly used lineup that doesn't have a long, a long, one of the two long guys that we're talking about, one of the two bigger wings is Brunson, Quickly, DiVincenzo, Randall, Mitchell Robinson. That lineup is minus 8.3 per 100 possessions and is giving up 128 points per 100 possessions. Only 62 possessions. You can't really like read into that as meaning anything. It's too small. But my point is, if Tibbs' hypothesis is you need to have one of these two long guys on the floor, they're bigger guys, relatively, of course. If you need to have one of these two bigger wings on the floor, let's call them big smalls. You need to have one of the two big smalls on the floor at basically all times. If that's his hypothesis, and then he sees, well, we're minus 19.6 when we don't have one of those guys. He might be thinking, well, this is backing up the hypothesis. And, and by the way, if you're like, well, why isn't there a reporter maybe on this podcast who can go ask Tibbs about that dynamic exactly? I will. I literally looked up the numbers today on all of this after I did the podcast. So I, I will be asking Tibbs about that because I think it's a really interesting dynamic. And last thing is I, I really have to go. My wife's about to kill me. It's not only that. It's not only the big smalls thing, but you made the point on your pod about how there is a difference between Grimes and DiVincenzo and quickly and Brunson in terms of the size and the, I don't want to say the physicality, but like they bring a different something to, to the on ball defense, even DiVincenzo. There's a little bit more there with him than quickly, not to say that quickly isn't a better DiVincenzo uh, d- uh, defender than DiVincenzo. He is in a lot of other areas, but in the specific ways that opponents can exploit when you have X amount of smalls on the floor, that little bit matters. And it, it, I mean, look, it all goes back to the same thing you were saying before in a completely different context. Tibbs builds the defense from the inside out, but it is all about built the sturdiness of the defense. I am not, I will, I will concede in other areas. I am not, not springing leaks in areas that I could avoid. Um, And look, we could, I mean, people listening to this podcast know where I stand about his his decision making and his sensibilities, but that's, I guess, where it's to each their own, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, it's all subjective, my friend. But look, I, I look at it and I'm like, are, should they be any better than they are right now? No. I feel like they're exactly where they should be. Um, Justin is telling me in the chat, uh, any words on the Dejounte Murray rumors? 20 seconds, Fred. Do you think the Knicks are seriously kicking the tires on Dejounte Murray? I, 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 I'm intentionally leaving dead air on the podcast. <laughs> Fine. I'm just like, <laughs> every move the Knicks make if they want Jalen Brunson to be part of their future should be yes they should ask the question how does this person fit around Jalen Brunson does he enhance Jalen Brunson and if the answer is not absolutely then you shouldn't give up the whole boatload of stuff to go get that guy and this is a conversation we are going to have, by the way, when it comes to if it comes well, to the that's, Mitchell thing. That's the because that is the conversation, which, boy, I am leaning in a way that I never thought that I would lean because uh, Donovan Mitchell's really fucking good. But he's so good. Com- yes, he's awesome. He's, he's awesome. awesome player. Awesome. Player. I, I, I did not have an MVP ballot last year. I said that if I did have one, I would have him fifth. There you go. I'm MVP. Um, he is an awesome player. Yes, but uh, again, context, nuance. These, these, it's funny how these things occasionally matter. I need to go. Um, uh, I thank you, Fred Katz, for being you, for doing a podcast from your hotel room. <laughs> I'm a fucking compliment in Oklahoma City. Uh, tell the folks at home where they could find uh, you and uh, all of the uh, things that you do. Read my stuff on The Athletic. Uh, you can subscribe to my podcast, Cats and Shoot, uh, at patreon.com slash cats and shoot. 
please be sure to check it out there. I had Benji Ritholtz, as John said, on this week. So I'll have another another episode later in the week. I do two episodes a week. And uh, I'm going to stop talking so John's wife doesn't kill him. I had a whole bit that I was going to do about how it's your fault. What was it? It's your fault that Emmanuel Cook is not getting more minutes, right? It is. Yes. It is my fault. Exactly. You should work. You should work on that. Please, please, please blame me. Please blame me. It's 100% my fault. We're not asking tough no questions. What do you even do all that? I don't even know. You're, 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 I watching, literally, you're watching Thunder Wolves. That's what you're doing. I'm watching Thunder Timberwolves. That's it. Slacking on my primary job and just watching two awesome teams duke it out in OKC. Uh, Fred Katz, uh, thank you for doing what you do. Uh, it's a uh, a gift to have you on the beat and uh, needless to say it's even more of a gift that I get to come and, and bullshit with you about all manner of nonsense on this podcast um, look forward to uh, your next article you dropping articles all the time dropping podcasts now twice a week subscribe to Cats and Shoot on Patreon subscribe to The Athletic read Fred Cats and uh, if you like this podcast uh, do do the things that uh, one does when they like a podcast and uh, you know s- spread the love because that stuff helps us out. Uh, We will be back with more funny games very soon. Until then, peace out.